great, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I'm going to speak about the hands-free hectare then. Uh, it was uh, multiple buttons. Uh, yeah, uh, Innovate UK, uh, which is a government funding uh, body, funded project between ourselves at Harper Ranch University and the commercial entity that is Precision Decisions, who is a precision farming provider uh, from Yorkshire. So uh, let's firstly define what agriculture is, or from my perspective, define what agriculture is. It is the ability uh, for the few to feed the many. It's the ability for the 2% to feed the 98% using technical and scientific uh, means. Um, and if you look back in time, that technology was once a, a basically a stick at the very start of agriculture when we first started planting seeds, and today it'll be a tractor or whatever. But you know, we're on a we're on a, a, a cycle of growth and uh, development. Uh, we have to feed this growing population then, so uh, you know, the classic graph, we're going to have uh, 8 billion people by uh, the year 2050 at least. Um, and we need to feed these people with less land, less resources, uh, less water, um, and probably less people involved as well. So we have to increase efficiency, we have to reduce waste. Uh, and one of the ways we can do this, and one of the things that is looked at, and one of the things that is constantly talked about, is uh, precision farming where we're going to manage our fields or our uh, groups of animals in a smaller amount. So rather than looking at whole fields, we can take it down to single plant level one day in the future, hopefully. Um, it's all about managing variation, so observing some variation and then making a decision to try and put that variation right. Uh, and we do the right thing at the right time, the right way, and at the right place. And if we do all those right things, we should have less waste and better crop grown. Now, we have a few problems in agriculture as well. We have reduced rural labour. So farms that once had five workers on them in the UK will now have one, um, due to whatever reasons, urbanisation, uh, urbanisation of the work they do. Uh, most people in the countryside aren't working on farms, they might be web designers or whatever else. So um, we've, we've turned to ever larger machines to make this, make this happen. We went from horses to big old steam engines through small diesel engine tractors and many of them through to big tractors, 600 horsepower, uh, 30 tons sat on the field and that's caused us some issues in terms of uh, compaction and uh, limiting our time windows because uh, with limited time windows we turn to big machines because we think we can cover more ground quicker but what they tend to do is those big machines also reduce those working windows so if the soil is wet I have to wait for it to dry longer to get my big machine on the field. Um, so we also have uh, one upmanship is a real big problem in the UK. Uh, it's the easiest way to sell a farmer a tractor for it to be bigger and shinier than the tractor they had last time. Um, standard commercial organisation, uh, big shiny tractors sell. If your neighbour's got one, you better have one. Um, and this is a real issue that we face. And you find people pulling the same implements, but with two or three times the horsepower they did before. So four metre drills being pulled by 250 horsepower tractors when you would have called that with 80 horsepower. So, absolute crazy situation that we find ourselves in. Uh, and what, what do these big machines do? Well, they, they give us a lack of resolution for this precision farming thing. I want to do the right thing at the right place, at the right time, in the right way. But I have a boom that's 40 metres wide covering an awful lot of ground. And I can't vary the rate or vary the chemical that I'm applying along that boom. So we're blanket broadcast happening all along that strip. So that's not very precise. Uh, in, the, in the instance of a combine header, the wider the combine header, the less the yield resolution that I'm capturing. Uh, compaction, well th this graph is interesting, it's a classic graph from the HDB. Um, it shows that we've had a yield plateau in cereal crops since the year 2000. So we had a, basically a linear growth in terms of yield per area uh, since World War uh, And then, since the year 2000, it's flat. So everything that anybody has sold a farmer in the cereal industry for the last 18 years has not achieved anything. So any chemical, any fertilizer, any big machine, anything that you've been sold has made no difference. Um, and why is that? Well, one of the things that it seems to be is because of this very poor soil health and compaction. Why is that compaction there? Well, it's there because of these very large machines. So big machines solve some problems, create other problems, flatline yield. When you account that for uh, inflation, whatever, we're making less money. <laughs> Uh, so, one possible future then that has been talked about for about 20 years, these aren't my ideas, these are the ideas of the 
people, the community I work within, are that potentially small robots could be the future. These little things that look like a bit like vacuum cleaners. They go out and they treat every plant as an individual plant. So ultimate precision farming. Um, so we increase the resolution, we reduce our waste, we potentially have a marginal gain. Uh, we also reduce compaction. These are little tiny machines aren't you putting soil, uh, soil damage into the ground, and therefore maybe we can unlock that yield plateau, and maybe we can increase our yields. Small robots operate in swarms, we have loads of them <coughs> all out in the field because they don't all need drivers anymore, so they can, we can have lots of them, and therefore we cover the same area. We still need to manage these things, we retain jobs, in fact we probably make the jobs more appeal, uh, appealing to a younger generation rather than just driving in straight lines on a tractor. I'm now a fleet manager with lots of robots that look a bit like vacuum cleaners um, and potentially that's more appealing. Um, and these small vehicles are intrinsically safer as well. So I will to make the 600 horsepower quad track I showed you on the last page. It goes wrong. It's going to drive through the fence, through the hedge. Uh, it's going to go over the road, through the house, kill the baby. Yeah? If I automate a vacuum cleaner, it's going to get to the fence and the story stops. So an intrinsic safety benefit, and if we're ever talking about automation, that's one of the things that people are concerned about. If we move our practices, this is a piece of mass I did a long time ago, but if we're ploughing, we're moving about 1,900 tonnes of soil per hectare of land that we do. So that's a lot of soil we're moving. If we go to some sort of punch planting system, which you might utilise on one of these robots, we only have to move something like 11 tonnes a hectare of soil. So 150 time reduction in soil movement, and therefore look, we can only think that that's going to be 150 times potentially reduction in energy use. Now, these aren't really aren't new ideas. Here's, here's, oh, no, wait, so, sorry, I, ooh, I went the wrong way there. But uh, here we go. So, the problem with this is, people look at it and it's too far advanced, yeah? This looks like 2050, this looks like space age, long time away. Um, I believe in these statements. These statements all make a lot of sense to me, but this picture turns me off. It doesn't really excite me because it seems too far-fetched. And if I show the farmers, they have that same feeling. And I was doing this for a number of years and getting fairly blank faces looking back at me. Now, if I show them this picture, farmers get warm and fuzzy inside. And I get warm and fuzzy inside because this is a T20. And the T20 was the first tractor that most farmers drove. It was the first tractor that I drove. And everyone likes them. And they have many of the same characteristics. They're smaller, lighter. They're kind of more precise because we've got smaller implements. But the problem is we don't have the people to drive them anymore. So let's, rather than make vacuum cleaners, let's make robot tractors and just make the tractors smaller. So this is the idea. Um, a slightly different viewpoint then. So here's me making a robot in a very academic way. Took a thing, made a robot, because that was the, the, the task. You are tasked to make a robot, made a robot, drives around the field, finished, drives around a robot pitch, doesn't achieve anything. Uh, here is uh, my colleague, Jonathan Gill. He came at this from a different angle. He was working in the open source community developing, making drones. So he's a hacker. Uh, and the open source community are a bunch of hackers in bedrooms all around the world doing something for the fun of it. So they've turned mobile phones into flying machines. Those flying machines come out of the box, they fly point to point to point, land back at your feet. Very cheap, very reliable, very accessible now. We can all go and buy a drone. Okay? So, what we basically said is, I believe in those robot tractors of the future, and all the projects so far cost lots of money and they don't achieve anything. You believe in this cheap, accessible technology, why don't we try and bring those together? Now, when we were working together, this is the sort of stuff we were watching. This is a uh, video from NASA, obviously, uh, an impression, an artist's impression of what happened when the Curiosity rover landed on Mars in 2011. And this just shows what we, the human race, can achieve when we put our minds to it. We've got the best people on the job. This thing has flown six months through space to get to this point. It, at the point when this is taken, communication relay takes 15 minutes. So if we want to control this, there's a 15 minute delay. It doesn't take 15 minutes to land. So this is all happening in time. Every step. So it's come down, the parachute's open, the thing's dropped out, the jet's firing, the thing hasn't flipped over and crashed yet. It's coming down, here it comes, it gets more exciting in a second. And this is all happening in 2011, and it worked. This, this thing is on Mars, sat there doing a job right now. 
So when people tell me that robot farming is 50 years away and that I'm talking rubbish and it's impossible, well frankly watch this video and look at it. So now it's finding the ideal place for it to land, or where shall I land, making a decision all autonomously, nobody in control, out of control range frankly. Here it comes, it's now a crane, it's a crane lowering a thing. Nothing is impossible when we can make a crane on Mars. Nothing is impossible anymore. Okay, so here it comes down onto, say, onto the, the floor, and I will pass on now because I've got lots more to say. But here it is, ready. Amazing. So there's Curiosity rover happily on the surface of Mars, and yet farming with robots is impossible. Um, so myself and Jonathan then. Just decided to flip this up, look at it from a different point of view. Rather than set ourselves a project of making a robot, you go on YouTube, there's loads of robot tractors, we made our, set ourselves the challenge of growing a crop with robots. And therefore, by pushing that boundary of what we wanted to achieve, we weren't just going to do another sort of white elephant project. Uh, so the, world, the idea was it would be a world first. We'd have automated machines, growing an arable crop without operators in the driver's seat or a grass on the ground. So nobody goes in our field. Our field is square, it's flat, it's very boring, but it makes it easy for us and it's an easy first step. Um, yeah, nobody goes in the field at all, so we use things like drones and stuff like that to do the agronomy. Uh, the objectives were, A, be a world first, two, change the perception of automation capability and inspire through the media. I'm really keen on inspiring a younger generation into our industry. and. Uh, if they only hear bad news stories, why the hell are they going to come and work with us? So, I was trying to get that message out there, and we were going to do that by pushing social media and getting on TV as much as we possibly could. That was our aim. It's gone kind of mental. Um, we were going to utilise technology that already exists. We weren't going to spend loads of money developing, reinventing the wheel. We are going to use the wheel and just make it a bit better. So, uh, yeah, that was, that was the plan. One year, one chance, keep it simple, stupid, uh, all of those sorts of things. Now, to get this idea off the ground, this is where we had to go to Precision Decisions. Clive Blacker is an uh, expert in, and an early adopter of precision farming. He's had a company since the year 2000 doing this stuff, putting auto steers onto farm, um, putting uh, soil mapping onto farm for a long time. So we knew he was a, a first mover, we knew he, had a bit, he was up for a bit of risk. So we approached him and said, did he want to work with us? And, and luckily he said he did. And then we employed this chap called Martin Abel, and Martin was really key because, just like myself and Jonathan, he shared this passion that robots could be the future, and shared that enthusiasm that we did. And uh, that was what enabled us to go forward. So, yeah, we got funded. We got funded by Innova UK. Um, we got £200,000 out of them, which, in the world of research and academia, is actually quite small, and therefore we represented good value. And if it had all gone wrong, it wouldn't have been a huge waste, and if it all went well, well, wouldn't we have achieved a lot? So, we got, we got well, A, we had value on our side, uh, we had collaboration, so what I've not mentioned is we had uh, five or six companies who'd, uh, who'd written letters to say they supported what we were trying to do, even though they didn't financially support us, they were going to support us through products and advice, so we had seed companies and chemical companies and uh, tractor companies, like Ziki were going to give us a tractor, so we had that collaboration network around us. Um, it was a world's first. If you're going to do anything, you're going to ask the government for money. You never ask them for the money to pay for a world's second. Uh, you know, that's a fairly no-brainer. You know, let's, let's push boundaries. Uh, and we had a clear plan. I clearly look like a bit of a blagger. I wave my arms around. Uh, I'm a senior lecturer at the age of 28. But I do have some work in me. And uh, we've done lots of planning. We knew exactly what our system was going to look like on paper. We knew what our tractor was going to look like. We knew the hardware we were going to use. And we had all that, and we had it you know, put it across to them in what was obviously an okay bid because they decided they'd go with us. Well, if you're going to grow a field of crop, the first thing you need is a field. Uh, Harper Adams, for anyone who doesn't know, is set in a rural location. I know that some of you might have been there, some of you have studied there even, if you've met some people. Uh, so, yeah, we've got a farm that surrounds campus, that's great. So we, we took, this is, this is the rugby pitch at Harper, uh, and we took the field next to it, right on campus. We built a safety fence because, well, you know, we're going to run robots around. Students are hopefully going to come and watch it, but we don't want them in the field tire kicking, which is what my students do. Uh, so we put a fence up to, to keep them away uh, a little bit. Um, we didn't have much money, so we needed a mission control. So we went and pulled a old marketing trailer out of the Stinger Nettles and repurposed it. Uh, so a little bit of a bit of uh, 
uh, innovation there. Um, we started off by making things like radio control cars drive themselves around the field. Um, and, and the first time we got put on the media was with a uh, wheelchair that had been adapted to drive itself around. And we got lots of negative, that won't ever work, that won't farm, blah, blah, blah. But obviously they didn't miss the point because that was just our prototyping phase and, and they didn't really listen to the interview. But once we got it right, we transferred it onto a thing that, in many aspects, looks and feels just like a T20. Um, just like that idea that if we had smaller machines, they would work. This is brand new, it's out of Japan. One thing that's really critical with it is it's a hydrostatic transmission, which means it's very easy to take control of in an autonomous way. There's no gearbox to worry about. Um, we also got a combine. This combine's 30 years old. We've repurposed that into a robot. We use things like very basic stuff like <coughs> motors and actuators to move and pull and push levers to make this thing a driverless machine. Uh, this is what the system looks like, roughly. Uh, we have GPS up in the sky doing its thing. We receive GPS signals and that tells us where we are. We, we create uh, plans, uh, waypoint plans in the mission control, and then we upload that through a telemetry link to the tractor. We have lots of video feeds and things like that so we can keep an eye on what's going on. We have an RTK system so we're, we're accurate uh, in position, not necessarily control, but position we're accurate 10 millimetres. Um, and we have a laser scan on the front of the tractor, so if anyone comes into the environment or the tractor leaves the environment, it all shuts down. Uh, again, yeah, we weren't going to do, we did all the agronomy remotely as well, so we've got these like scout vehicles that go into the field, scoop up plant, plant samples, soil samples, bring them back so we can analyse them in the lab. We use an awful lot of drones to go and fly and take RGB pictures, but also uh, infrared pictures so we can start analysing our crop and trying to make decisions without ever going in the field. This is what it looked like. So, just to show how, how, how impressive this open source stuff we used is, we didn't develop any of this from scratch. We started in October 16, this is in April 17, so in six months we have nothing to a robot tractor farming in a field, which is more than most people had ever achieved. Um, and that was only because we harnessed this open source stuff. You see we obviously drilled it, we rolled it, we've got a scout out there collecting samples for us. You can see how bad it is, you can see how bad it is more. Um, lots of misses, lots of wiggly lines, it was not perfect, this was a world's first, it was a feasibility study on a tight budget and a tight timeline. We sprayed the field, and here it is, you can again see how bad, how many wheels we've got. Look at that, look how wonderful that is. Um, <laughs> But, you know, it was a world's first, so I was quite proud of this at the time, and I spent a lot of time showing these images to people, uh, and being very proud of them. Here we are, though, this is, uh, this is the, the combine. The combine drove a lot straighter. Here it is out the crop. This is spring barley year one, I should say. So, uh, yeah, there it is, unloading some grain. Marvellous. So, that was quite cool. Um, it had quite a lot of impact. Uh, but clearly we had lots to do, and it wasn't that, it wasn't perfect by any means. But we had done it. At this point, you know, we'd achieved the world's first. We'd grown a zero crop fully autonomously. Eight, uh, ten times in the field, nine times with the tractor, once with the combine. Uh, that marvellous thing of combine harvesters is you use them for no time, it costs you all the money. Uh, so, yeah, it wasn't a one-off. We didn't just do it for the cameras. We didn't just go, oh, it's working today, film it. We had to do it every time we needed to put fertiliser or chemical on the field, it had to work. And therefore, that pushed us to a level of, um, that's why it wasn't ever perfect, because we couldn't make it perfect, because we've got a crop to grow, we've got to get on and do it. So there was a real time pressure, and that's what made us get through, uh, without just going, oh, it's too hard, let's stop. Uh, the ASDB, uh, who we've already heard from today, then funded us for a second year because we said, well, we want to make these things better. But we had to you know, say we were going to do some stuff for the money. They were actually going to give us money for nothing. Um, so we looked to try and improve our agronomy. This is our agronomist here, Kira Mosh, works for Hutchinson's. And here is uh, Rosie. She works for Bayer Crop Science, who are our chemical sponsor. And um, they basically did a lot of work looking at trying to use their chemicals in a more precise manner and you know, not just, just use them willy-nilly. So we've got things like spore traps. This is sniffing out disease in our crop and then deciding whether we should spray and what we should spray for. This does not work. But we tried it. We gave it a go. Uh, at the moment, it's, it's, it's you know, alpha prototypes. 
But they will get better. This stuff will work in a couple of years' time. We will be able to sniff the disease and work out what to do. Uh, we looked at lots of weather stations. Uh, I've got, I think we've got three or four weather stations in the field now. People just seem to give us weather stations, uh, which is great, because you can tell stuff from weather stations. So, you know, if it's, if it's warm and damp, then you're probably going to have a, uh, a fungal disease issue. So we can start telling stuff in that. And that was one of the things we looked at improving. Uh, on the agronomy side of it, just a point to make in terms of the small machine, it rained in Shropshire from October to March, it rained 117 days out of 160 days. It was wet. The soil was wet. Nobody got their T1, their first fertiliser on, on time because you couldn't go in the field because you'd sink up to the axles of your tractor. We did. On the 14th of March, we put our T1 uh, fertiliser on, on time. And you can't even see where our tractor's been. So in terms of this does smaller, lighter, nimbler work, in my opinion, this kind of shows that it does. It allowed me to put an input into my field exactly when I needed to without causing any damage. And the people who farmed around us commercially could not do this. Um, we improved the, uh, the autonomy then, so we made the thing drive for, uh, straighter. This is 2017. You can look at some of these gaps in this crop. This gap here is probably nearly a metre wide. Um, we've still got gaps here, but these gaps are more like uh, 15 or 20 centimetres. So a great improvement in how straight the tractor drove and how much co uh, coverage of our field we achieved. And it looked a little bit like this. Um, one of the aspirations was to unload on the move, have the combine unload into the tractor on the, on, on, on the move, which we couldn't do for year one. Uh, this is obviously sped up. But you can actually see how much faster we drove in the second year. Our systems improved enough that we could up the tractor speed. You've got a lot straighter driving. The crop still isn't perfect. We missed some of our applications because we were at things like cereals, doing demonstrations and silly things like that. And then we got to harvest and we cut it. And this is winter wheat this time, so we put winter wheat in the ground. You can see how much straighter everything is, how much better it is. And we got our unload on the move. We got the, the, uh, the money shot um, of the two machines <laughs> driving alongside one and loading into the other. And again, this is a world first, no one had done this. Uh, so, yeah, we all did this on our very minimal budgets and things. Now then, what do we achieve uh, other, than, other than just a bit of fun? Well, we made some good publicity for the agriculture industry for once, something that we are scarcely lacking, you know, we, we, are, we are massively lacking good publicity. It's always neonicotinoids, it's always glyphosate, it's always TB, it's always bad press. And what we managed to do through harnessing social media, and frankly my numbers on social media aren't that impressive, but they were good enough that we got noticed by the BBC, we got noticed by uh, Sky and the Times, and then once those sorts of people start playing out your story, then you get picked up by people like uh, the New Yorker, or the Hindu, or New China. And we've gone all around the world with our story, publicised as a British world first. And something that hopefully people can be proud of, and hopefully people will find inspiring, and hopefully interest people to come into our agricultural sector. So, we've had 85 plus countries publish it. Uh, if, you, if you look online, and our marketing department have tried to record it, I think we've got some, oh, well over a thousand people who have republished our press releases and stuff like that. It's an awful lot of impact. Uh, certainly, considering I'm academic and I've not written a scientific paper on this yet, um, but my impact, I believe, to be far higher than any paper I could have written. Um, why did I get that? Uh, why did I get that impact? Well, and why did we get that interest? Well, we kept moving the story. What do you do with four and a half tons of barley? Well, the obvious answer when I was asked that on a, on a TV interview once was, we might make some beer. Um, well, everyone got hung up on that, and then I never got, I constantly got the question of where's the beer then, where's the beer then. Well, the beer kind of went wrong, but my colleague surprised me for my wedding and got it made into gin instead. Oh. No, that was good. E. So we got, you know, A, we created a lot of hype around beer, and then B, we created a publicity stunt around gin. Then we won an award. You know, you can't choose to win an award, we won an award, it was very nice, but we made a really big deal out of winning an award. Look, we've won an award, we're three young chaps, we've done a, a fairly impressive thing and someone's given us an award for it. There's a bit more publicity. Okay, three weeks later, everyone stopped caring, 
We won another award! So let's tell everyone about that as well. We won a BBC Food and Farming Award. Uh, we got uh, Alex James off of Blur to say that we did a cool thing and he shook my hand and said, oh, no, no, it's amazing. That's quite cool. Uh, um, we got, uh, so, we, so yeah, we did a story about it. Um, okay, no one cares about that anymore. So, you get Jeremy Corby into your field and you feed him a pizza. You cut some wheat with a combine, you mill that wheat on the side of the field, you turn it into a pizza and you feed it to Jeremy Corbyn and you get a bit more publicity. And suddenly Jeremy Corbyn knows about our project. But then no one cares about Jeremy Corbyn anymore. So, <laughs> so then we unload on the move. And we make another story about unloading on the move. And the reason we've had any impact at all, and the reason we've had anyone show any interest at all, is because we've kept moving the story along. And if we keep moving the story, we keep telling people the story, people will keep engaging, people will keep being inspired, and hopefully somebody, somewhere, might do something even better than we do. Uh, yeah, in terms of impact, we've had political impact. Uh, Mike Gove has been on the field. This is Mark Walport, who is like head of research England, decides where funding gets given. He went and kicked our tyres. Uh, Princess, the Princess Royal, Princess Anne, she speaks about us at conferences occasionally. Michael Gove speaks about us at conferences once in a while. They put us in the Brexit paper on you know how we're going to cope with uh, uh, the death report paper on how we're going to cope with Brexit. We've got to mention. So, you know, we've done quite a lot of things that impact our world, and all, as I say, without that scientific paper. Uh, this all comes back to moving the story, but we talk at conferences all around the world. This is Australia, this is Canada, this is Oxford. We won some awards, we've already said about that. Now, in terms of, for you guys there, what does it really make any difference? So, other than my, you know, my grand plan of inspiring people, what does it really make a difference uh, on the ground? Well, we've shown that precision farming equipment doesn't need to be stupid amounts of money. Everything on this tractor that makes it a robot, including our RTP <coughs> system, which gives us high precision, costs about £10,000. Now, we have contacts in strange places like prototype labs in China and things like that. But the point is, it shouldn't need to cost £10,000 just to make a tractor drive in a straight line. It's cost that for the last 10 years. The price that the service provided has not improved, it has stayed the same, yet the price has not dropped. And there is no other thing in the whole world where that happens. Your phone has either got quite, twice as good or you pay half as much. But yet in precision farming, they still, the big companies, who I obviously have no friends in, uh, are still charging stupid amounts of money to make tractors drive themselves in straight lines, to monitor what's happening on the field. And, and what we sort of campaign for is, look, it really doesn't need to be that expensive. There are other ways. And there are companies coming through using similar technology to what we do to make that happen. And uh, if you look hard enough, you will be able to find cheap on-farm precision farming solutions. Uh, in terms of going forward, and in terms of, I guess this is based on the UK and what we can try and get out of it um, as, as a nation, which might not be that applicable here, is, is, is that people think this market for these small, smart machines are going to be worth an awful lot of money by the year 2050, 240 billion a year. So if we're going to do that, uh, if they're going to be worth that much money internationally, wouldn't it be a great thing for us to try and grab hold of a chunk of that as a nation? Uh, and if we don't move, other people will. So this is Japan, this is Kabuta, and they're going to sell you a full range of autonomous equipment any day now. And this is Australia, and they're going to sell you an autonomous sprayer next year. And this is Canada, and they're going to sell you an autonomous seed drill next year. So if we want to do this, if we want to grab a chunk of this and not just be the people who did it first, but the people who continue to do it, we need to make a move. Uh, in terms of then, uh, technical requirements and therefore jobs. Um, this is a picture from the 1960s and it, it, was a, it was an idea of what farming might look like in the year 2000. So uh, I'm only 17 years too late, but we got there eventually. We've got tractors driving in fields and somebody watching them from a cabin on the side. But what this shows is, is kind of what I agree with in the terms of what I think we can do is go multiple tractors in a field, multiple machines I should say in a field, they might not look like tractors in a few years or in, in 10 or 20 years, but we're going to need this person who is a skilled person, it's not dirty, horrible work, it's going to be a skilled job being the fleet manager of your robotic farm. We're going to need agronomists who can cope with this IoT data, 
this sensor network that we're going to put out in our fields to make this to make these decisions. We're going to need programmers and agricultural roboticists to make these things. At the moment, there's not very many of us doing it, and uh, in future, we're going to need more and more people. So they're good, exciting jobs. We're going to need a developed communications infrastructure. At the moment, all of my communication is based on Wi-Fi and radio waves uh, that, are, that are, are local. Uh, to make my system commercial by any means, I need to be able to drive it into any field in the, in the country, or maybe on this island, and it just to work. I don't need to have to put up infrastructure to make that happen. So 5G is really important. And uh, you guys are obviously harnessing that. But 5G is an immensely important piece of technology to make automated field agriculture work. Um, what else should I say? Yeah, I mean, in terms of the traditions of robotics, where does robotics ever fall? It always falls in dirty, dangerous, or dull work. And if you look at agriculture, you can find dirty, dangerous, and dull all over the place. And therefore, we are rife. For, we, we, are, we, we should be the prime candidate for, for, for automation. Make those jobs more exciting, less dangerous, and higher skill. Um, another implication is that you don't need huge budgets and, and huge multinational companies to innovate. Small teams, small budgets, through collaboration and through what I call the Skunkworks model, can, um, can make innovation happen. There's three of us. Three of us and not much money, but an awful lot of passion, an awful lot of drive, and an awful lot of um, combined energy has made this happen. This isn't a 9 to 5 job, we don't go home at 5 o'clock ever, we're often out in our field till 10 o'clock at night. If we all just clocked off, it wouldn't happen. So if you find the right people, and you give them responsibility, and you give them uh, capability in terms of a bit of money and a bit of knowledge, it's amazing what people can achieve without being a great deal. Uh, we can utilise technology from other industries, and which is what we've done. We've, we've Grab stuff from here, there, and everywhere, and made it work. Uh, and, and we're young, so that's the youth quake bit. I think agriculture certainly needs more young people in it. What are we doing now, just to finish off two slides? Well, we are actually working on 5G. We're part of a 5G project where we're looking to streamline all of this mess into a single 5G gateway. Uh, it, you know, we should get 100% coverage, which is critical, low latency, and high data rates, which are all needed for agricultural robotics. Uh, we're also then involved with a thing where we used to take some funding to make our tractor drive from our workshops, from our machinery store, out to the field. So it will drive itself to the field and then go farming, whereas at the moment I still have to personally drive it to the field. So that's the sort of stuff we're doing at the moment, um, trying to keep the story moving, trying to keep the story evolving, trying to keep the inspiration going. Thank you very much. Thank you.